Um, what I want to talk about uh, today about is um, satellite and aerial imagery. Um, it's a little bit exotic topic for an angry conference, but uh, um, I think many, many people are not really aware about um, what uh, kind of developments we have seen so far in the last years uh, on the topic of uh, advanced imagery. <laughs> Okay, um, first I'll talk a little bit about the history um, of uh, aerial images, satellite images, and um, how they are being used. And then you can quick overview about the military and intelligence systems, um, how they have developed and uh, what kind of systems are being used today. Um, and some commercial systems that are available today, some words about resolution. Um, and we'll hopefully show some examples some simple methods of analysis that everybody can learn just experience and some more advanced methods and uh, give an overview of what to expect in the next years. Um, historically, um, um, historically the um, area of image business has been a military business. Um, so um, the first things that can anywhere near that we could have today about aerial imaging um, where the um, balloons that were equipped with the big plate cameras in the uh, first world war and a little bit before uh, where really adventurous people uh, jumped off the balloon and made images of the enemy troops um, and it developed quite, quite rapidly in, in the uh, second world war we saw, saw the first uh, specialized aerial reconnaissance plans that have been specially constructed to Occupy the camera and, and, and guy who visits the, the enemy troops and, and takes photographic images of them. And after I go over to um, the Cold War, uh, did a really lot for um, bringing up the school spy photography business. Um, the main uh, main race between uh, airplanes and aerial defense um, found its presumed end in the U2 incident. And it was when the, uh, an American was being shot down with an U-2 uh, spy plane, which is a huge black plane um, over Russia and for Soviet Union uh, was then, and um, it basically put an end to the uh, aerial reconnaissance business uh, above Russia because uh, no further U.S. president wanted to risk uh, voters uh, votes for uh, yeah, having shot down. American pilots over Russia. So the satellite thing needed to, to go on. Um, the first satellite program um, that is now nearly completely known because it has been declassified um, was the Corona program. It was the uh, first military system in the US and in the world. Um, it was uh, from today's point of view, technical curiosity, because what they did was um, shooting up a big camera in a satellite and uh, taking a lot of images and returning the film black uh, back to Earth with a little capsule. And the capsule descended uh, through the outer atmosphere into the inner atmosphere and there um, unflat in parachute. And since the Americans were really paranoid about the Russians getting to know what they were doing there, and they catch the parachute in the air and uh, try to, to calculate the landing area in a way that it was always over sea. Um, so they, um, they, uh, they put in an, um, an salt block in, in, the, in the wall of the capsule. And after 48 hours, the salt block was dissolved and the capsule was uh, running full of water and going uh, down to the water. So they really, really, really wanted not to attack rush to know that they were up to there. Um, the, the power incident, as I, as I said, and um, the direction of the Soviet war triggered a massive investment uh, into satellite programs. They were running since 1957, um, where the Sputnik shock put a huge boost on that, and then after Poland and after the Berlin Wall, um, the Americans really, really wanted to have something uh, that uh, the Russian defense could put down. <coughs> and, and this Corona program was quite successful. It had the, the usual amount of bureaucracy in there and, and the usual things that, that happened at the start of American uh, intelligence programs, um, but it was uh, overall successful. And the interesting thing about Corona is that it's um, declassified now. So you can buy 
all the images for 1960 to 1972 for token price at the uh, what's it called National Image Resources Data Center or something like that, which has some US government agency. There are also some, some books having been published in recent times about this program. It's uh, very interesting to see because uh, they had unique kind of programs. <coughs> Never anybody had before had um, deployed large amounts of film into the vacuum of space or new vacuum of space. And uh, their problems was uh, things that the elastic from the from the rolls that transported the film um, all the time built up an electric uh, uh, charge, and this charge on the film, so which was with an, with an spark and uh, ruined half the film when it happened. And they, they had no, no, no model for uh, calculating the problem at that time. It was end of end uh, end of fifties. And what they did was they did a purely um, experimental approach. They just ordered huge quantities of these rolls from, from the manufacturer, put them into, into apparatus that run huge amounts of film over that and measure which build up electric uh, discharge and which not. And just build into the, the few satellites that they shot up, the five or six from the 100 that didn't build an electric charge. So <laughs> that was the basic, the basic model of doing it. And uh, they had, had a number of interesting camera systems in there. Um, they also used um, refurbished or rebuilt um, cameras from, um, uh, from normal manufacturers for mapping purposes. Um, the, what, what, we, what they get from, from Corona images is resolutions between 6 and at the end a little bit better than 2 meters. Um, in the early beginning it was what, between 10 and 15 meters. And, um, they also have mapping cameras for having huge areas to that. The problem is that by the laws of optics, um, the, the more focused you are on an object, the smaller the area of the photograph. If you would think that the uh, Soviet Union and, and the other interesting countries for the US covered over one third of the Earth, um, it was a little bit impractical to just only have a camera that focused on a small object like uh, searching for an ICBM. Uh, installation that was the main task of Corona. Um, so they had mapping cameras, and one of these mapping cameras they fitted from, an, uh, I think it was a puzzle blood standard camera, and they needed to modify this and that, and then they found out that they had a problem. Um, when they put on the, the normal stock camera into space, they tried to do a vacuum chamber, then fine powder, uh, which was being used to, to, um, to um, make the shutter better gliding, uh, dissolved onto the film in the vacuum, because these cameras were not built for vacuum. So they convinced um, a California optics company to buy a huge uh, alone, which was the smallest thing available, a special vacuum uh, tested uh, fluid that made the shutter that appropriately. They used about 20 milliliters of the fluid, and uh, was in the end, still was with one gallon of the stuff, and that was about uh, $1,500 at that time per liter. So it was, yeah, okay, <laughs> they were special customers. So, um, uh, another thing that is very interesting about the Corona program that's being now declassified is juggling the amount of money that is really going into such a dark project and what is going into cover projects. So, we had about five to seven cover projects that were something that sound vaguely like it could be matching with the activities going on in that building, but they are not the actual activities. Like they had been something with going on with optics that, that were sounded like okay, it could be possible, but in reality, the building of the satellite camera that the company named it. And uh, so, up to one third of the whole, uh, whole uh, budget for a black project goes into cover project and security. So, only two thirds are going to the actual product. <coughs> so, the Russians were not sleeping here, and they were the first to space, but um, they had their, their own kind of problems. Um, they built on a system called Zenit. Um, the first successful image was Zenit 2, it was in Cosmos 7. Um, uh, the real the space exploration of the Russian started with Cosmos 1 using the priority. But after they were barely able to, to guarantee that, that they had an object in space that uh, could, uh, could uh, keep an atmosphere and uh, could uh, be kept from falling uh, back to Earth and control, the first thing they did was shooting up in camera. One, one thing that, that you know is having a camera in space is incredibly difficult because you have a free moving object. Everything mechanically that moves inside that object make, that makes the whole thing jitter. 
so and you need to stabilize the thing so that it doesn't rotate. So you need to have gyroscopes and all kinds of stuff. So it's a really, really mechanical problem. Um, the Russians were not that rich with the American uh, counterparts, so they returned the camera and the film, not just the film, as the Americans did to throw away the camera. And um, that gave them, an, uh, after they, they had two years lost in this internal troubles, um, they gave them an enhancer in, in terms of quality development because um, they could debug the cameras. They, they were returning the cameras, and so they could debug the cameras to see what the problem was. And, uh, rather than improving the cameras so that they got a uh, much quicker um, resolution um, uh, increase than the Americans had. Um, the Russians uh, are still using photo return satellites simply because uh, the modern electro optical satellites are damn too expensive when it comes to, come to the data. And these, these twin return satellites do the job for, for a lot of purposes. So, in, um, for instance, at the, uh, one of these crises between Israel and Egypt, um, they fired up uh, one satellite on one photo uh, uh, return satellite every four days. So that they, they kept up for nearly two months. So it was like bam, 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 everything they had. And they returned the satellite, loaded the film, put it up on top of the rocket, and bam. So that, that was, was how they were doing quick reconnaissance in these days. Um, Okay, the, the, today you can, you can buy the results from these satellites. They are uh, called uh, KVR, and KVR 1000 is the satellite the, the, the stuff that's all being sold today on the internet the server. Um, that is what you can expect from, from, from such a uh, KVR satellite. What we see here is an about 2 meter resolution image of the uh, old uh, signal intelligence installation of the NSA and the Trophus back in Berlin, Germany. Um, what, what we see here is um, quite interesting. Um, it doesn't look like much, but we have here, we have here an access road going through that thing, and we see that it's clearly a defined thing, plus here's the exit road, and here we see the black line, obviously something like perimeter control or something like that. Um, but you couldn't see much of buildings, you could very think, okay, that could be a tower, but only if you know something about the object, it was not, not really what you wanted. So, um, the res resolution uh, race was, was going on, and, uh, and there was, there, I don't know how many Corona satellites, but there were several dozen, and um, they were continuously developed. They, they included in the end two cameras, two stereoscopic images, which in increases the possible resolution that you can see the object of. And, um, today's satellites um, have 10 centimeter, 10 centimeters resolution. That's the that's the resolution that you get from uh, an military pure um, satellite. Um, there are even sources claiming that the um, the, the quite recent uh, uh, resolution is about uh, about six centimeters. Um, that is quite good. It's far away from reading license plates. Um, <laughs> If, if everything happens in that, yeah. and that, I can show you a little uh, nice example where this license plate, uh, plate reconnaissance business is uh, debunked a little bit more in, uh, in depth. Um, so, but 10 centimeters resolution is quite a lot. So, 10 centimeters resolution is uh, they, have, they have this national image interpretation reconnaissance scales uh, in the US where they have some nice examples like. Okay, six centimeter resolution is if you can recognize the little wing in front of that anti Russian anti aircraft rocket, a rocket, or ten centimeters of resolution is if you can identify the hinge of the um, uh, uh, of an installation where they uh, are shooting SS sixteen or whatever from. So they have all these natural and very recurring examples for whatever <laughs> there. Um, uh, but uh, the, from from these these kind of, of of things that are being published or that are leaked or going through uh, by Freedom of uh, Information Act research, um, you can guess a lot about uh, how far they are, what, what kind of resolutions they have, and uh, and uh, how their their mechanisms uh, look like. One big big problem that uh, uh, they have is image interpretation because that's something that uh, can be done by software if you have standard objects like counting a lot of tanks that are standing somewhere is not a real problem or looking for Russian uh, anti anti aircraft site is not a real problem because um, they all always have uh, some kind of star of data pattern that just, if you see it once you recognize it everywhere. And 
but other things are more difficult. For instance, they, um, they had an uh, account of uh, Russian ICM sites in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the 60s where they were looking for these really, really huge rockets uh, to throw uh, um, um, atomic warheads to the, to the US. These are major installations. It's not like, like a rocket that you know from, from what they are from Paris, or the, but that's more like a rocket they want to, to shoot in the spaceship up. So that is a real installation. And, um, one thing how they identified these, these ICBM sites, even if they were um, camouflaged, was because these rockets are so huge, the streets going to these, through these, uh, through these sites that they have to transport the rockets on, can, they could only have a certain angle of bending because the rockets were too long. They, they, they wouldn't fit through the, through the street if they were too narrow. So they, they developed all, all kinds of things and, and, uh, and stuff for, uh, for identifying typical Russian installations. And um, it is an interesting game, but it is really difficult. And they, they never solved the problem of having enough people and having enough dissemination stuff for, for, for the things until they, they got to start electronics. Um, nowadays, the, the QL class satellites are sending up the images uh, digitally. They are not sending them down, but up, um, because they don't want everybody to, to read their mail. So um, they're sending the images up to um, to an, uh, a uh, satellite network that uh, flies on higher orbits and uh, gets the thing transported to the other side of the earth where they need to go down to the Pentagon or wherever they had their stuff. Okay, this is the same installation at uh, so called 25 centimeters resolution. And now it gets even more interesting. Um, um, so the first thing is we see, okay, it's an access road. And we have these brown things here. These look like you know, redomes. Would be everything from radar to, um, to satellite dishes. They don't want to have your enemy uh, knowing where the satellite dish is turned to. Um, then we have another tower here. You see that this tower by the shadow here. You see that? Um, even if you don't know what to look for a shadow, then you can get it better. Um, so, what could we do with this image? We could, for instance, guess how many employees are we, uh, we working there. Or do we do that by counting the parking spaces here? <laughs> that, that is the, the kind of tricks that, that they developed over, over a long time. So another thing that we could see is obviously um, the number of entries was uh, is not the same number of entries that has been planned for the facility because here we have parking grounds that have been made later. That there was some, some, some other installation there. And there are one of the most useful things is photographing such an object in the air. So that's what, they, what everybody was doing there, the Russians and the Americans and vice versa. They had analysts that were responsible for an object, like that missile installation in the URA, or that kind of stuff. And uh, they were responsible for analyzing all kinds of information that was coming from, from every source, and they were all we the 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 tasking well. of that uh, re-imaging. Um, these tasking problems, the, the tasking means determining the point when you need another photo of that image, uh, of that object, uh, is incredibly difficult. Um, in the beginning, they had a huge problem because they couldn't influence the satellite once it was in space. The Corona satellites had a program stamped on a Müller tape, um, like, in, like the, um, what's it called, the you know, tape with, with holes punched in it, and uh, these holes, yeah. Punch cards, yeah, punch, punch, punch cards, yeah. And uh, these, these holes determined when the camera was going uh, uh, to go off and uh, on. And the problem was that once the thing was in space, they couldn't uh, switch the camera off even if they knew that they were on the clouds about the ob object. And uh, they had returned close to about 60 to 70 percent uh, images only with clouds in the beginning. So, okay, but, uh, I, I, if you look um, at the data, so we can buy the corona images. You see that they really, really tried hard to photograph the, the, um, the uh, war between East and West Germany at the time the war was wrecked. But they couldn't get it. They photographed clouds and clouds and clouds and clouds. <laughs> so, okay, that's for them. Um, so that, um, that, that game developed to a point um, where the Russians were actively seeking for whether anomalies on, on their territory was huge. 
So the conflict across the throw is if you're doing something secret, if you know there are satellites going over, uh, you want to have your secret stuff into the hole and the thing goes over. So if you have to move it in every 20 minutes, it's a little bit stressy. Yeah. So um, they were looking for it with their clouds. Okay. The Americans counted, of course, <coughs> um, by um, actively exploring the, the, the thing of radar satellites. And radar satellites are you know, an interesting thing. It's called, uh, called synthetic aperture radar. Uh, radar. Okay, I'm going to start um, the encoder. What it's doing is imaging the Earth's satellite and using the, the moving of the satellite and the artificial enlargement of the antenna. And by that, they get one. meanwhile below one meter resolution. Um, I didn't copy that. Uh, I didn't copy that. 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 Okay, it's too much. Um, and the, the new satellites are combined these. You have they have uh, uh, synthetic aperture radar and uh, and images. So if you if you would have radar or if you if you would have an uh, image that uh, goes to the infrared spectrum, you could possibly see what is work uh, are happening inside these ray domes. If there is a satellite which is actively uh, uh, working in one direction, so communication and not the reception antenna. Uh, you would see the heating of the hole from the from the, uh, uh, from the radio energy. So you see it on, on uh, uh, if you have an uh, infrared image. Um, okay, this this is one uh, an artist conception of, of a uh, modern uh, American uh, image satellite derived from various sources, rumors, all kinds of stuff that uh, that have been uh, floating around. Um, uh, they have changed the configuration so far that uh, the, the image mirror is uh, not on the left axis but going down there. So they can move that, that mirror here in order to um, to have uh, monitor objects that are uh, to the side of the path of the satellite. If they will only go uh, down, they will only go down, be a very small path. <coughs> and synchronous with that is that they are radar yeah. antennas, so they could. Uh, do images that are both optical and radar. Okay, that's the usual usual kind of uh, uh, stuff that you need: the um, multimeter, downlink dish, uplink dish, data relay, and so on. So, um, one uh, extremely um, uh, good source for the information about this, uh, unfortunately, is uh, www.fks.org. There was a research scientist, uh, scientist stands, uh, named John Pike, um, who uh, actively got into the pool of the tool of image interpretation by commercial satellite stuff, doing uh, test and treaty verification on, on its own with satellite imagery and so on. And he's basically the father of, of uh, civilian uh, uh, use of, of these, uh, these kinds of uh, stuff for resolution imagery for political causes. Okay, um, the optics um, is quite simple, um, or not. It's, uh, and uh, and uh, multi mirror reflection system is a secondary mirror for uh, the image is not, not, not uh, right here. Um, and in the end, you have the, um, uh, the, the imaging plane. Um, the first generation of uh, image satellites had tubes in there because, uh, because uh, at that point the 60Ds were not uh, developed uh, far enough, so they used imaging tubes like in the, in the early uh, TV cameras. And um, one interesting point is that the, um, the optical system is nearly identical to the Hubble satellite. And also the, the rest of the system is nearly identical to the, to the Hubble satellite. And incidentally, the Hubble satellite was being developed by the same company that built these satellites. Um, but there's, there's a really good book about this uh, whole Hubble thing uh, called the Hubble Wars. And uh, that guy has some really interesting insights. For instance, uh, one, one thing that uh, uh, the Hubble uh, designers got from them was a, a secret paint. The paint is secret because um, it does not reflect any light at all at any frequency. It's uh, below measurability and um, it's called Marietta Black. And uh, that is being used to paint the inside of the tube here so that, that you don't have any stray reflections from the inside of the tube to the mirror, which would be great image, uh, image capability. Another thing that they didn't get from them was information that if you have a really high resolution imaging satellite, um, we have a problem with your solar panels. 
Uh, yeah, you remember that there were, uh, in the beginning of trouble, there were a lot of promises, yeah, the resolution is not high enough, that the sharpness is bad, and so on. A lot of that trouble was from migration that came from the solar panels heating up and cooling down again, and heating up and cooling down again. And that added a vibration to the system that the, that the drivers were not able to compensate. So the whole thing started to jitter. And <coughs> on, a, on a conference years later, the um, guy who wrote the book uh, was being told by the guys from the black part of the universe, um, yeah, why didn't you think about it? It was logical. We had the problem with that satellite 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing that I considerably pissed off was that um, the, uh, obviously, the NSA has already uh, adaptive optics um, working in, uh, in satellites. It means that the mirror image here is not a, a fixed mirror, but a flexible mirror. <coughs> and uh, with the flexible uh, mirror, you can compensate for image distortions through atmosphere turbulence in real time if you have enough, enough, enough computing power. And that would, would have been one thing that would uh, so, uh, save the Hubble problem. Because one thing that you also can do with an active mirror is compensating for optical errors that you've done in other parts of the system, because you, you essentially can, can manipulate any, any parameter of the optics there. OK, so reading what Hubble tells a lot about the, the kilo class satellites, but uh, not in every aspect. OK, this is in comparison with um, in the in concept of the corona system. Um, uh, the, the system had a uh, quite different approach to the, um, to the camera system because the camera system was moving in that way because the satellite is flying and you want to have, you want to have the, the camera focused on the object flying over so the camera was moving with the object and um, that kind of, of, of stuff is not uh, necessary anymore so the mechanical considerations are, are quite less extreme in that. Um, the next slide, yeah. Um, that is what you get to see from American uh, imagery today. Um, you see it, that it's an uh, image that has been used in the World War uh, for the propaganda for uh, the, the accuracy of the weapons, the CDO bunker sites. Um, from the, from the, the roads, you can guess that it's uh, bunkers for airplanes because it's a typical pattern for if you want to move airplanes fast in, in one direction and have uh, service access to the rear of that. Obviously, they should quite good there, possibly in other areas not. <coughs> um, what we can see here is, um, and the image is a little bit different if it's a satellite image or not, because one of the interesting parts is here to see the fine structures of that hall. And if you know a little bit about, about buildings, such buildings and stuff like that, you would guess that it's about 30 centimeters, these, these structures here, these are bars that are supporting the roof of it. So let's say, okay, this is about 30 centimeters, these little black lines here. And um, so it could also be that it's not an uh, intensified <coughs> cell level, but it's an area of which from a very high coming plan. Um, yeah, this is a uh, typical image of a not very precision bombardment because you see. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, one, one thing that's um, <coughs> interesting about the image is. Um, um, these are oil tanks here, and um, one of the interesting questions that you have if you're analyzing an object is um, how high are these objects? <coughs> one thing that you can do um, to calculate it is if you know all the parameters of the of, uh, how the satellite or the, the, the airplane uh, flow uh, and where the, the nag means the middle, the uh, geometric middle point of the image is, then you can calculate from these parameters and now and by time the, um, the image has been taken the height of these things by measuring the shadow and the, uh, the distance to the middle of the image. Yeah. Okay, the civilian sources available are a few. Um, um, the first one <coughs> that um, got to the market was the company space imaging. Um, Former called um, Iconos uh, after the satellite. And they are the first uh, who successfully launched an, an, uh, an imaging satellite after losing one. Um, there, there was the paranoia was a little big after they lost, uh, lost the first one. And uh, especially after after the loss, there were some more agreements on the, 
um, shutter control policy. Um, we'll talk later about the resolution that you can, can buy from them is uh, uh, one meter monochrome with four meter spectral. They also have combined products where they um, use the monochrome product to, to sharpen the multispectral product. Um, just in, I guess twice not, uh, not uh, you can buy them also auto rectified means that they have removed all the uh, geometrical distortions from the uh, turn on the different heights and uh, satellite angles so that you have a flat image that uh, is like uh, the, the piece of earth is flat and you can count pixels to determine um, lengths and, and, uh, and distances. Um, the problem with them is that they are quite expensive. The minimum order is um, $600 for on tasking. Tasking means that they can that you can say, okay, I want to have an image of that area. Um, they have a 20% cloud cover policy. That means that there, if there are 20% of the image covered with clouds, it's your problem, not, not theirs. Um, the, the best way from uh, to, to get images from them is uh, use the archive images. Um, uh, uh, these are available for dollar uh, one thousand. Um, this minimum order gives you um, two patches, eleven by eleven kilometers in monochrome, and um, one archive image is also eleven by eleven kilometers. That, that's the image size that you get from from these um, all for one uh, one thousand dollar. Um, the standard format for that is raw, which means that the image is a little bit uh, bigger. Um, the uh, if you need it really quick, they have a policy of not giving you the image before uh, before 72 hours. Why so? Um, before they had a policy, their biggest customers were the uh, defense ministries of uh, you know, countries that were involved with the Earth Because uh, if you have a uh, real-time imaging capability, that, that kind of money, six thousand dollars per one task in the room, that's it. nobody's thinking about it. Yeah? Um, so then, uh, so they introduced a three-day period to, to uh, make their product unattractive for buffering uh, capabilities, but it's still useful for for uh, capabilities, of course. Um, in interesting cases, like if uh, John Pike goes on and says, "Okay, I want an image of the Israeli nuclear reactor in Daimona," um, then uh, it took 30 days for delivery, unannounced, um, and um, they also had an uh, needed to degrade the image by law to two meters resolution. So the, uh, there was this law from the Congress saying, okay, uh, that area of the world and that's the case Israel cannot be sold in image form from satellite or any other source um, to, to anybody else uh, better than two meters. Um, interesting enough, the Palestinian Authority managed to get Quite detailed area images of Israel officially from the Israeli Geographical Institute in about 50 centimeters of the moon. It was one thing that the Israelis were really shocked about when they discovered it. Um, okay, these shutter control policies, we'll talk a little bit later about their um, set of things, but okay. Um, and uh, quite new sources, image of international. That's a uh, consortium of Israeli, Russian, and Jewish companies that uh, just became operational one week ago. They sell about, uh, it's not 1.5, it's 1.8 meters monochrome. They are all in uh, only called over centric, where they use the same resolution twice uh, to, to get in, uh, in a high resolution. They get about one meter monochrome. Uh, they have not yet announced the prices for their product. Um, but what they have announced is that they will provide imagery of Israel in one meter resolution without uh, yeah, yeah, uh, American interference. And uh, the, the Americans were quite angry about the mission of the national because um, they are allegedly violated a lot of patents from American companies for, Israel for imaging, but the satellite was being built by Israeli defense industries instead from the Russians. And um, so it's a quite political thing there. Um, the source of the, the, the biggest covers and the, the lowest prices is um, this uh, Giga 1000 the family time capsule satellite images. They are being sold by Terrasov, and it's a Microsoft uh, outfit that is selling all the uh, images. Um, the, the quality I've seen for some applications is okay, for some it's not you know, okay. Um, one thing in image interpretation is getting used to the optics. 
But the human eye is not really accustomed to, to the aerial view. So it's, it's uh, every, you know, it's really looking out of the uh, airplane window and the reason not going to go the airway. You're getting, getting to, the, to the view if you're doing it a while, trying to actively analyze what, 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 what the vector is working and what, what how does it look like. Um, another factor is that the properties of the sensor are, are determining the, how the image looks. If you have a multispectral sensor that is going deep into the infrared area, the, uh, the image can look completely strange. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have to because it's on a crash computer. And um, yeah, another thing that, uh, that can completely disorient you is that, um, features like shadow, how the shadow is, is uh, lying. You can often you will have it, it will happen that you mistake a shadow for an object or vice versa. Um, the light on the, the sun is uh, shining at the moment. The snow is uh, extremely interesting. If you have snow on the other, on the area, you, you would recognize anything. Um, another a very simple trick is if you if you're not getting familiar with the image, you stand on that piece. Um, one thing that really helps is rotating the image and show it at the moment. Um, what really helps you if you want to get into that game is there. Uh, Get an aerial image city map of your city, of your hometown, and they are available from all cities in Europe now. You can buy them for cheaper, for 20 marks in most cases. And just walk around with it and get, try to get used to how this looks on the ground and how this looks on the, on the city map. It's quite interesting. Okay. Um, what we have here is not a in really interesting intelligence agency installation, but a in storage facility for natural gas in Berlin. Um, uh, interestingly, these, uh, uh, these things here are uh, made of the same construction as the so-called elephant cages, which are the direction flying antennas of the NSA. And uh, if we rotate the image, you see it looks completely different. The sun can flip it. See, and you see completely different things. Sorry, if you have it uh, in that way, you. you you, you wouldn't get the perspective right until you've seen the data image there. Okay. And um, this is a uh, 50 centimeters uh, black and white uh, image. Um, and the, the very simple um, method of determining the resolution of an image is car windows. Because, you know, how big a car window is, it's about that wide and that high. If you look on top of that, it's about that size. So if you can see the uh, car window as individual pixels, so two or three pixels, like we have that that's visible there, okay, unless we can consider that that, that that car here has three pixel window, so it's about 50 centimeters of the room. Okay. Okay, um, when you when you starting to, to analyze an uh, aerial image or a satellite image, uh, the first thing that you should try to do is uh, Identify the location. Try with the city map or try with an, an, another map of, uh, of the area where you think the image is from and try to find where it is because that helps you very much because you can look for things that have any relation to each other. Then begins, just in your mind, begin identifying the easy objects, the things that are obvious, like trees, houses, cars, parking lots, stuff like that. And then move on to the more difficult things. Like so, diff more difficult things like trash containers or um, yeah, windows or whatever you have, you have in there. Uh, what you want to, 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 to analyze. Um, if you have an identified a real difficult object, take a note for it because it will help you later on if you stay into the game. Um, one thing that you will learn after a while is trying to guess from things that you can see about things that you can't see. So, like uh, if you're interpreting an image of a ship and you see. Huge antennas on top of on top of the chip. Um, you can you can look for something like a generator that uh, provides the additional power for the signal installation that is obviously on in the chip. If it has been refitted later, or if you're looking at an at an, uh, a tank facility where there's a lot of tanks need to or repair, you can easily look for for signs of an something like a gasoline storage facility because it's obviously near. It's always depending on, on what you're looking for. Um, Counting things is very interesting, as we have seen it in the parking lot example. That is the thing that is all being used commercially, like determining the output of a pizza facility. 
that's something that can easily be done with area lots of like imagery. You're just counting the, the trucks that are going through the facility and going from the facility. And you also just count the, the loading docks that you have there and you know how, how much load the facility can be. So, and uh, if you know about the chemical processing, looking at an area in the mid from, from an, of a chemical plant is quite interesting. You can see a lot of things like where goods are being delivered or not, or what kind of pipes are going from what point to what point. That's, so if you, if you have a basic understanding of the process going on at the facility, you will get a lot of things on the on area of satellite images. Um, the only way to learn is, is, is try it and, 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 and train yourself. It's not that difficult, it can be easily done. And uh, I will set the, the, um, put up the presentation on some web server, and then there will be an yeah, URL list of all those books and economics or whatever, uh, where the basics of setup interpretation are being taught. The problem is that most books that are in the public domain um, are just going for the usual things like. Uh, what kind of trees are growing in that area, or what kind of soil is that is in that area, or the other usual urban planning things that are being taught in the university. But nobody is really uh, sending you a book that uh, tells you how the military emission interpretation works. Unfortunately, yeah. Okay. Uh, one, one very interesting thing is time to use as I told you. If you have the ability to pass um, multiple images uh, from, from one area, even over the years, even if, uh, if you have 20 years between them. Maybe you're buying in Corona image of the area, getting to Terra server, buying in, in a PVR uh, image from the early 90s, and then you find uh, another image at another source, and then you can, can easily find out how the, 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 that object or that thing developed, like if it, if it declined or if, if there were, was, uh, was more personal moved, like it seems to talk about that image. Um, stereo imaging is another interesting thing. I promise that you need a little bit of equipment. It's not that cheap, and I haven't found so far uh, suffi sufficient uh, software systems uh, that can be used as uh, stereo images in the public domain. And I, I don't have the money for um, commercial stuff. Um, the multispectral imagery is also very interesting, but um, that requires a lot of thinking, and um, because the um, if you, even if you're doing image processing to, to try to get features that are visible only in the infrared or whatever, then more like you would see that or what you, like you would expect to, uh, to look at it. Yeah, it takes a lot of experience to know, okay, this, this, um, this kind of reflection means that, like, okay, this, this kind of bad and short reflection means um, that uh, these trees are old and, and uh, will die soon and something like that. Um, Another thing that can be done even without the interpretation is um, taking a look at the uh, archive database, for instance, uh, at uh, image that are space imaging. Because they're putting every image into the database to sell it, sell it again. And you just need to look for an area like John Pike did with the, um, with the Chinese coast, and, uh, uh, and what he found was that obviously the Taiwanese government because who else would have an interest in that has a weekly abonnement of the Chinese coast. <laughs> Again, a weekly strip of the Chinese coast is one of the best monitored areas in the world, obviously, um, because you really want to know what is going on there. And it's okay, it costs them, I don't know, one or three thousand dollars a week, but it's not, not the kind of money that's interesting for them because it's uh, still below two million dollars a year. So, and uh, it's a lot cheaper than having the five hundred million dollars to set uh, shut up on image satellite. So but okay they, they they know that the Chinese know that they know. Okay. <laughs> and uh, obviously they are, they are much interested in um, airfields and sun installations and um, one thing that will that I will touch on briefly is um unmanned aerial vehicles <coughs> UAV. Um, these are just Planes with all colors. <coughs> yeah. They are available um, in various models, possibly, and meet in the meanwhile, civil, uh, uh, um, all the way around, for the military and uh, later on, civilian markets. Um, the latest thing is um, one that was uh, it's called Global Hawk, it was in the news some time ago, and it's um, <laughs> Yeah, the size from seven to seven, seven to seven, no, not that next small. The box. Um, flying for thirty-six okay. hours Thank you. and delivering imagery resolution uh, ten centimeters. Most drones, which are rare, 
and it has life supply companies like the life supplies have, and it has plans with all the direct human interaction. That means that they can say, okay, fly over the Atlantic to Australia, take images from there, and try to fly to wherever the next base is and land there. So that the, the command set is start, go there, land. So, and, um, okay, we all want to have such a toy, but it's a little bit expensive. Um, the civilian models are, have been planned, but at this moment, the military market is big enough. System prices below $50 million, because so. If you happen to have a little venture capital over, then it would be a Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can, can imagine what, what will happen if these things are in the civilian domain. Obviously, there's a market for buying such a thing and having it over Europe. All the